Welcome to the Common Good Podcast, a conversation about the significance of place, eliminating economic isolation, and the structure of belonging. My name is Rabbi Miriam Turlanchamp, and I'm your host. For this episode, Brad Wise, Darren Peterson, and Joey Taylor speak with Walter Brueggemann about myth, exodus, and how it relates to the work of the common good. We begin with Walter explaining why Peter Block's work needs to be partnered with a narrative myth. I think that the reason that what Peter is doing needs a narrative myth behind it is because it is trying to do work that contradicts the dominant myth of our culture. And you can't beat a myth without a myth. So the dominant myth of our culture, as you know, is a privatized, individualized capitalism. It's a myth that is everywhere pervasive and not very often made visible, but it is a very powerful. And you cannot oppose that very powerful myth of privatized capitalism with bits and pieces here and there, but you have to have a sustaining narrative that you can at least entertain the thought that this myth is more adequate than the myth of privatized capitalism. So I think we are in a a struggle to see whose narrative is the most reliable and the most productive and the most adequate. And so far as it being a religious myth, I believe that every founding myth has a dimension of holiness to it. So if you look at the practice and assumptions of the Wall Street market, it has a powerful religious component to it that that we are doing something that is sacrally significant here. So the claim of the biblical narrative is not the only narrative that makes an appeal to religious rootage. I think every serious myth makes that kind of appeal. And you can see that if you look at the distortions of Marxism in the Kremlin, they've turned Lenin's tomb into a religious shrine. So every myth has to have some sustaining rootage in some form of holiness. So Walter, I've heard you talk about an ideology as a totalizing belief system. Can you differentiate between an ideology and a myth for me? (laughs) Well, yeah, myth is what I confess, and ideology is what you've got. (laughs) Myth is always in the form of narrative that allows for playful, inventive interpretation, whereas ideology tends to be a closed system of absolute certitudes. But you're right to spot the parallelisms uh, between the two. And sometimes the the biblical myth has been turned into an ideology that is a package of certitudes rather than a playful narrative. And when it becomes a package of certitudes, I think it loses its power and propulsive force. Could you talk about why the narrative of the Exodus is so appealing to you? Why is that? Why is the myth of the Exodus the one that you've chosen to give your life to? Uh, well, I think it chose me. It is the founding uh, myth for Jews and Christians. And if you set out to spend your life with the Bible, which I have sort of done, you're going to be led back to the Exodus. And I think it resonates life story because my father was a poorly paid, sometimes poorly treated pastor, and uh, emancipation for him and for my family got to be a really important narrative enterprise for me. And my own life's story uh, is about an ongoing phenomenon of emancipation. So it resonated with all of that as well. When it comes to myth in general, I wonder if you can just talk more about like 
what does it take if you if you're trying to find a myth that can beat the dominant narrative of privatized capitalism like what else makes a myth strong enough to be able to take that on what makes a myth powerful enough to stand up the narrative myth has got to be uh, thick enough to uh, be sustained through a lot of challenges and a lot of crises uh, it's got to be substantive enough that people know what the claims are. It's got to be open enough uh, that it can be adaptable to all kinds of new circumstances. So I think you cannot set out to devise a myth. It simply emerges out of the life and suffering uh, of the community as the community reflects critically on what it has found to be a reliable claim. Uh, and it has to be found reliable, it seems to me, over many circumstances and during many different times of emergency. And it, it wears well, I think. I do not think you can find a generic myth. I think myths always belong in particular communities to try to make it generic without the marks of particularity will be to lose its authority. Now, at the same time, I've already said the myth needs to be open enough to allow people from outside the community to bring their own experience to it. But obviously, those of us who adhere to the story of the Exodus, we believe that the question of emancipation is a mark of all human experience. It's not a, a matter that is peculiar to Jews or to Christians or to Muslims. Everybody either yearns for emancipation or has been emancipated. So at the level of human experience, it is something that we have in common, but our narrative myth gives a particular articulation to it. And the particularity of the articulation, it seems to me, is as important as the generic experience. So the community, whatever the community is, it has to be able to get up and recite it together. And you have to have words for that. And as soon as you have words for it, uh, you have some particularity and specificity. I don't see how you can get around that. We are watching the same challenge to the uh, founding myth of America that is essentially uh, a European conquest. And then it becomes a question about how non-Europeans can get in on the American story. So the story has to be shaped and shuffled to make room for other people, but you have to keep the storyline straight. Yeah, I heard a lot of what we're seeing right now is, you know, a certain side of the political force here in America has always been about borders, specifically in the, the southern border. But now what we're seeing a, a lot of fights are around like the narrative border, that the the myth of American exceptionalism and the go west and all that, like that's is what's starting to erode. And you're starting to see like a lot of the fights are around right. that border, which is interesting. You could probably say that we are, uh, at the moment, trying to do the work of re-articulating our founding national myth. And I think you could probably say that the Jesus movement was one crisis of re-articulating the, the Exodus story that they did through the life of Jesus. And then, and then it became, for the church with Jews and Gentiles, a question of how much continuity do you keep and how much discontinuity can you risk, which is always the process of reformulating. Are, are we invited, Walter, to re-articulate the Exodus myth now? Well, I think we do it all the time, yes. We've re-articulated the Exodus myth around the race question, around feminism, around uh, gay lesbians, and so on and so on, so that the narrative comes to pertain to many circumstances of which Moses had not yet thought. Walter, um, you mentioned earlier that myth has a sense of playfulness that you play with it. And I was curious about how you have sought to play with the Exodus myth. 
Well, let me first of all say that the, the documentary hypothesis of JE, D, and P in the Pentateuch already shows that Israel had a lot of imaginative freedom because the J articulation and the P articulation of the Exodus narrative have almost nothing in common. So there, there that is. You know something of my work. Some of my work has been to insist that the Exodus narrative be a contemporary imperative that reflects the continuing will of God for the emancipation and restoration of justice for those who have been left out of the pharaonic deal. That process goes on and on. There are those who, who believe that Marxism is a skewed form of the Exodus narrative. So it's not impossible to see the Exodus narrative behind the French Revolution or the Chinese Revolution or wherever you want to look for it. Michael Walzer, uh, a great um, Jewish scholar, has uh, traced out the way in which the Exodus has been an impetus for many of these revolutions. This poem is called Moses by Luis Alberto de Cuenca. We'll hear it first in Spanish, read by Marian Peraza de Webb, and then I'll share the English translation written by Gustavo Perez Fermat. Take a deep breath and notice where these words land in your body. Moisés, dame la mano. Hay que cruzar el río para llegar al otro lado. Y siento que las fuerzas me faltan. Cógeme como si fuera un bulto abandonado en un cesto de mimbre que se mueve y que llora a las luces del crepúsculo. Cruza el río conmigo. Aunque sus aguas no replieguen su cauce ante nosotros esta vez. Aunque Dios no nos asista y una nube de flechas acribille en nuestras espaldas. Aunque no haya río. Give me your hand. We have to cross the river and my strength fails me. Hold me as if I were an abandoned package in a wicker basket. A lump that moves and cries in the twilight. Cross the river with me. Even if this time, the waters don't part before us. Even if this time, God doesn't come to our aid and a flurry of arrows riddles our backs. Even if there is no river. Now let's return. Joey asked Walter a question about the danger of dogmatic narratives. My worry about using a, a narrative like the Exodus narrative is that people will read absolutism into the use of the story. There won't be an ability to have it be open. It'll just become a new dogma. How do you guard against that as you talk about that story? Well, I think that one would have to have many witnesses who express the specificity of their own narrative of emancipation. So if you hear that from First Nation people or uh, Hispanics or whatever, it's going to sound somewhat differently, but it's going to resist being reduced to a white Anglo-Saxon controlled certitude by having many witnesses who say it differently out of their experience. Our problem with Making an ideology, as you know, is that all the other witnesses have mostly been silenced. When you silence all the other witnesses, then it turns into an ideology. I wonder if you could riff on the idea of like big truth versus literal truth and how that weaves its way into what we're talking about. Well, I suppose what I just said about many witnesses is that, that it is an invitation for people to tell their little truth. Many people have, have very small narratives of instances of emancipation, but every, every time we hear one of those, it requires us to modify the big narrative because we have to make room for new testimony. 
about that. And so the big narrative is always renewed and corrected by little narratives that arise from below. But if the myth is reliable, then we properly expect it to be recurring in many different settings. What keeps coming to mind is this thought of like when the Cohen brothers did, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? It was sort of a, a rearticulation of the Odyssey and wondering like, is that, could you do something like that with the Exodus narrative where it's- Of course, a, sure you could. Yes, right, yeah. As artists, if we were to go down that path, what warnings or encouragements would you give in that regard? I don't know where that might lead, but I think it's a wonderful analog for what we're talking about. As you play with it artistically, it's important to keep the main story straight so that it doesn't get dissolved into cleverness. But obviously, the Exodus narrative is enormously elastic in terms of how many different ways can you think to tell it. The uh, text in Amos 9-7 uh, is, a, is a really good one in which uh, Amos says, well, yeah, or Amos has God say, well, yeah, I brought the Israelites out of Egypt, but I also brought the Philistines out of corn and the Syrians out of Kaphtor. So I do, I do exoduses in many venues, in many circumstances for many different people, and every one of them is different, but I do them all. Speaking of particular narratives that challenge the larger narrative of emancipation, can you think of a narrative or two, a particular narrative or two that has challenged your concept of emancipation, maybe now or over the course of your life that's that's forced you to refashion your understanding? Over my lifetime, I've always been late catching up with the new emancipations. I was, I was not born a feminist. I had to learn that. I had to be taught that. I was relatively slow in seeing about gays and lesbians and so on. I wouldn't say it was disruptive, but it was often a, a great surprise to me to see that the narrative pertained even here. I can remember in seminary, I, I, I'm astonished about that, but but I, I can remember doing a double take when I heard my first teacher say that women in the church ought to be ordained. And the United Church of Christ was way ahead of anybody on that. But I had to learn that. I had to learn that the excess of narrative pertained to that, which my teachers taught me, and on and on. And was the unit of surprise, was it somebody's individual story? What was like the igniting factor that said, oh, wait a minute, maybe well, it's I, bigger? I think sometimes it was a specific person. Sometimes it was my reading. Sometimes it was my teachers. You know, I think it happened to me uh, in a lot of different ways. And I, I suppose what we're watching now with the environmental crisis is that we are, we are paying attention to how emancipation pertains to uh, rabbits and radishes and fossil fuels, and, which I certainly hadn't thought of a decade ago. One of the important dimensions of a founding myth is that it has a location, some type of devotion to a place. Just talk a little bit about what the importance yep. of place as it relates to myth. The way I would say it is that a myth has an historical location, but nobody knows where Mount Sinai is located. <laughs> the archaeologists think they do, but nobody knows. The founding place itself is probably an act of imagination. Nobody knows where the manger was, <laughs> and so on and so on. We imagine we know, and we like to claim we know, but I don't think that the specific geography is as important as the narrative specificity. The narrative specificity, it seems to me, can be put down in different places. But even the narrative specificity admits of many versions and many tellings. So it's all very elusive. <laughs> yeah, and what's the through line that needs to be maintained? You have a sense of like in that in that story, what are we what are we not reinterpreting? Well, the storyline uh, is that our people were helpless slaves before the power of Pharaoh, and Moses and Aaron were moved by holiness to work in emancipation in which the cosmic forces cooperated with their efforts. And the the goal of that emancipation was to get to Sinai 
where they could uh, organize public life differently in an anti-feral fashion. Yeah, when you put it like that, you're just like, yeah, that is the that's the American myth for sure of what brought the Europeans over yeah, here. That's right. And it does feel like that it, it's following the same you know structure that then those folks that built a new life elsewhere they eventually become the empire through then which everyone's right. trying to That's escape right. again which just is like king Sol- just like king solomon walter i i have this thought here and maybe it's coming out of the sense that i got two young boys i think they're trying to find their way through an anchor and a myth and i find that the dominant uh, myth is really compelling for them a magnet that is just pulling them. What thoughts do you have around people that maybe don't have a existing myth, how they go about finding one? Well, it's uh, signing on with a community of people that are seriously trying to practice the narrative. So our children need to be with people who think that the practices of generosity and hospitality and forgiveness are the most important things in their life. Even if they don't do it well, that's what they intend. So that the kids have the experience that this is real life stuff and you see it in the lives of people whose names you get to know. Can you speak more to just like why hospitality and forgiveness are so essential? I've decided that hospitality, generosity, and forgiveness are the primal contradictions of Pharaoh. Pharaoh doesn't welcome anybody. Pharaoh doesn't forgive anybody's debts, and Pharaoh is parsimonious about his vast store of grain. And the rules of Sinai are, we're going to organize all this alternatively. I wouldn't die for that triad, but I have spent a long time getting there. (laughs) I am really compelled by this idea that the dominant myth sends us to a place of fragmentation and isolation. How does that happen? How do we end there? based upon the the myths that we've bought into. If you start out with the assumption that the purpose of life is to gather money and power, then uh, everybody becomes a threat and a competitor. So it's inherently isolating. The assumption that that's what our life is about, all the rest follows. And the insistence of uh, the emancipatory narrative is, it's not what our life is about, but we live in a culture where it's easy to be persuaded of that. Thanks for listening. You can find more about Walter, Brad, and Darren in the show notes. This episode has been hosted by me, Rabbi Miriam Turlenchamp, and it's been produced by the amazing Joey Taylor. And the music is from Jeff Gorman.